Good morning. I'm Ellen Horseman with Camden, Arkansas First United Methodist Church, and I welcome you to our Sunday School lesson following the book by Amy Jill Levine called The Difficult Words of Jesus. The difficult words this week come in Matthew chapter 25, where you've had the servants who've been given money, and the very last servant doesn't make any money. He just gives them the one coin back to the master who takes it from them, gives it to the one who has the most, and then says in uh, verse 30, so this is our difficult verse, as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The real concerns here are, well, what is this outer darkness? Is it hell? And how comfortable are we with the idea of being tossed there into hell? Uh, in other words, it's a concern about hell and about whether there is a literal hell where people suffer forever and ever and ever. You know, I find Christians often talk about hell. And you'll see, if you're driving along, you see signs uh, on churches. You see references to hell frequently. I saw one the other day that had little quotation marks, and it said, you think it's hot here? Uh, and then it said God, as if God had made that remark, of course, saying, if it's hot here, what will it be like in hell? Uh, I've seen another one that said, uh, let's see, will your eternal home be smoking or not smoking? So you see signs like that, and you see these little skits uh, or little plays, heaven and hell houses, you may have heard of them. I remember once, uh, very uncomfortably, I had been invited to something, and I'm sitting there looking at it, and this church was doing a little reenactment of heaven or hell, and they'd have little scenarios where someone would accept Jesus and go to heaven, but others would not, and they'd go to hell. And they, they were trying to scare people. So we find that a lot. Now, Levine said that when she was growing up in the synagogue, she never heard anybody talking about hell. She said it was she, when she read Dante's Inferno that she began to think about this place, but especially when she became friends with a number of Christians who would frequently mention hell. And in particular, there were some who were worried about Levine that if she did not accept Jesus Christ, that she would go to hell. And then some others who worried about themselves that even though they were Christian, maybe they weren't doing enough, maybe they hadn't done the right thing, maybe they didn't believe well enough, and they were going to end up in hell. She says that Hebrew scripture doesn't really say a whole lot about eternal punishment and eternal re reward. The Hebrew scriptures view life after death as being in Sheol, and that's kind of a dark, shadowy place. Uh, it doesn't seem that God is there, but there's not any indication of punishment or reward going on there as well, as well. Not any suffering anyway. But the righteous and the unrighteous both went to Sheol. Now Levine said that the early Greek translators took that word Sheol and replaced it with the word Hades. And of course Hades was the Greek notion of the, the underworld, the place of suffering, where people received punishments that were in, in line with what they had done, but that went on forever and ever and ever. And so that notion kind of creeps into our thinking when we have these translations. She said in the King James Version, Sheol is rendered as hell, and in most of the subsequent, subsequent translations, so that if you read what we call the Old Testament, you're going to see a lot of references to hell, whereas a Jewish person reading the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, would not see these references to hell because the word used was normally Sheol. Occasionally it was another word, um, which I can't find right now, but anyway, that, uh, oh, here it is, sorry, Abaddon, which meant place of destruction, which was sometimes used in place of Sheol. But she said even the references in the Old Testament to this had more to do with people being rescued from Sheol. And she gives as an example, Psalm 30, verse 3. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who have gone down to the pit. She does say that when you read parts of the book of Daniel, when you read Isaiah or parts of the book of Isaiah, there's a hint of the possibility of resurrection and that by the time of Jesus, most Jews had come to believe in a resurrection. And when you start thinking about a resurrection, 
then there becomes the notion of a judgment. And that idea of a, of a judgment sometime after death really developed in the apocalyptic writings. Apocalyptic writings, a lot of times people are scared by them. They see them as prophecies about the future, but most of the time they were written, uh, they do have, uh, I'm, I'm interrupting my own self, but they do have uh, very strange symbols in them, kind of scary stuff, a lot of times beast, uh, kind of obscure things like that. But they were written in a way that the people who were reading them would understand the writer, but maybe the authorities would not, because they were usually written when people were being tortured, tormented. And the book of Daniel, which is uh, the latter chapters of Daniel, which is one of the first of the apocalyptic writings, is written not during the Babylonian captivity, which is what it seems like when you're reading it, but many generations later, uh, when you're in the Seleucid dynasty, dynasties, and there's a bad guy, uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, I think was his name. He was tormenting Jews. He was trying to eradicate them. Life was really difficult under him. So the writer references back to uh, the writings in Babylon as if Daniel is writing and looking forward to them being let out of exile in Babylon with the idea that he was telling his people, God will do the same for us. The wicked will not be in charge forever. God will destroy wickedness and, and justice will come. And so that's what you're normally finding in apocalyptic writing. But so there is, you know, talk of destroying wickedness and evil. Here's an example from Daniel that Levine uses. Uh, let's see, this is from chapter 12. But at, th at that time, your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to sh shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And as Levine notes, the text doesn't say anything about an eternal punishment that goes on forever. Instead, uh, the, the wicked have shame and everlasting contempt. The opposite of everlasting life with the righteous like the star is this ruined reputation, this contempt. The righteous shine on, she says, the people whom God judged as violating the covenant flame out. Well, let's take a look at the New Testament and hell. There are many references to hell in the New Testament. Uh, as United Methodist elder Morton Guyton points out, there are references to hell, but Jesus and his apostles focus not on the afterlife, but on entering God's kingdom here on earth. As Guyton says, in the book of Acts, where you see the Christian church growing, Christian conversion is not about escaping the uh, heaven or hell. Christian conversion is is about escaping the imprisonment of sin and joining with an amazing group of people who have received the power of the Holy Spirit. People are not converted by hellfire and brimstone in the book of Acts, but rather by seeing the Holy Spirit at work around them. Now, Jesus speaks of hell in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember the text where he tells you if your right eye is causing you to sin, then cast it out because it's better that you get rid of your eye then that you should end up in hell or be thrown into hell. And he calls, uh, the word he actually used was Gehenna. Uh, Gehenna was a valley uh, southwest of Jerusalem, notoriously uh, reputed to have been a place where the god, I think the idol's name was Moloch, was worshipped and children were burned and sacrificed. So Gehenna becomes kind of this idea of this reprehensible, horrible place. So Jesus says, well, it's better you, you, you uh, pull out your right eye or if your hand, your right hand is offending you, it's better that you cut off that hand than you are thrown into hell or thrown into Gehenna. Now, obviously, there's a lot of hyperbole going on here, as there often is when Jesus is trying to make a point. He's probably not literally telling us to tear out our eyeball or to cut off our hand. And he may only be referencing hell as, as a metaphor. Or as uh, Levine says it, she says, the text 
functions as verbal cold showers. She says that Jesus also goes on later and says that we should not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, Levine says that destroy means just that. It means destroy, obliterate. There's nothing left. So you see where Levine is going with her notions of what we would call hell. It's that a person is ultimately obliterated. There's nothing left. In Jesus' parables in Matthew or in, and in Luke, there are references to people being thrown out into the outer darkness or to the weeping and gnashing of teeth. One example is in Luke chapter 13. Jesus is asked if only a few will be saved, and here's how he answers. He says, well, when the owner has got up and shut the door, there will be those on the outside who say, Lord, open to us. In reply, he will say to them, I don't know where you come, where you come from. And they will begin to say, but we ate and we drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I don't know where you came from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself are thrown out. Then people will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and they will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. And you see how Jesus tied that in to the first being last and the last being first. And so that's why Levine says to her, this parable is less about eternal punishment that goes on forever and ever than it is about people having to move to the back of the line, people who thought they were first, and they're weeping and gnashing their teeth because they're, they're not at the front of the line. They're at the back of the line. They're on the outside. A similar idea occurs in Matthew uh, chapter 8, verse 12, where he is quoted as saying, the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Are these heirs the people uh, who think themselves safe? That's what Levine asks. She says, are these the people that think themselves safe because they do the bare minimum of love of neighbor but still hang on to all their resources? So it's obvious Jesus is trying to get us to to get off of our little pedestals, to get off of that idea that we have status, and to recognize and be humble and recognize how much we need God's grace. Matthew chapter 13 has a couple of parables where Jesus goes on to explain them, explain the parables, and talk about being thrown into hell. Uh, one of those is sometimes called the weed and the tares, where, where the wheat, the weed is growing, um, uh, the weeds are growing among the wheat. And uh, the owner says, leave it until the harvest and then we'll separate it. And then commenting on that, Jesus explains that just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says that again, and he talks about the kingdom of heaven being like people dragging a, a dragnet, catching all these fish, and when they get to shore, they, they're tossing out the fish that are not any good. And he says that, that so too the angels will separate out the evil and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be, you got it, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, Levine looks at these two, and she says there's no indication that this weeping and this gnashing of teeth goes on forever and ever and ever. Instead, instead she, she believes that the wailing and the gnashing of the teeth, that that indicates regret for the fate that is coming their way, which is oblivion. Levine says, I doubt that this indicates perpetual torment. Indeed, if, it, if these verses meant that, then there is no eradication of evil. Even in uh, Revelation, there's an indication of punishment, but there's also an indication that perhaps it's not forever. In chapter 14, John says of the wicked, they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but being tormented with fire and sulfur sounds pretty bad. 
But in his final chapter, even though John has said this, in his final chapter, it becomes clear that maybe that's not forever and ever and ever. Because John is describing the New Jerusalem and talking about how God will dwell in this city with his people. But he goes on to say, as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire, which is the second death. Now, Levine interprets that this way. She says a second death is exactly that. It's death. Dead is dead. Gone. Obliterated. No more. Now, I leave it to you. I think this would maybe be a better discussion question than, than a YouTube video or a podcast. But, you know, what is hell all about? And does this punishment last forever and ever? But I think a more important question is, why are Christians so obsessed with talking about hell? I think even more so than heaven. But why are we so obsessed about worrying about who's going to heaven or who's going to hell? Well, maybe sometimes it's because we do long to have this notion of justice, that wickedness will be overcome, that those who are terribly cruel in this world will be punished and that the good will be rewarded. Because it's pretty obvious that that doesn't happen here. Uh, people who are wicked are not always punished. And people who are good are not often rewarded. So that's one reason. But I think more than that, we obsess with it. Uh, why? Because we're thinking about ourselves. If you think about it, if we're obsessing all the time about whether I'm going to heaven or I'm going to hell, I'm obsessing with myself and not loving my neighbor like I need to be. Now this gets me back, uh, I'm going to refer back to a Reverend Morton Guyton that I mentioned early in this lesson. He was writing in a 2016 United Methodist Insight article, and he tells about uh, on the campus of Tulane, where he was the uh, Wesley Center director, that he was walking across the campus and some girl handed him a tract. And he said, it, the tract itself kind of outraged him because it was entitled, The Answer to Man's Most Often Asked Question, How Do I Get to Heaven? Reverend Morton Guyton says that this sort of notion about whether you're going to go to heaven or how do I get to heaven, he calls that afterlife insurance and says that that afterlife insurance or that notion of it is part of what makes Christianity be toxic sometime. I'm going to quote him. Afterlife insurance is what the gospel looks like when it has been shaped by worldly market forces into a consumer product. It's probably the most successful pyramid scheme of 20th century American society. It casts humanity's problems in strictly capitalist terms. God is the universe's moral banker. He is owed a debt for humanity's sin. So Jesus can pay the debt on the cross for those who believe. Or people who don't believe can repay their debt by being tortured forever in hell. The way to be insured against the debt of sin is to accept the Jesus payment plan. It's just another transaction that you add to the checklist of middle class security, not much different than any other type of insurance. You know, there is a lot of that kind of thinking, even if we don't own up to it, this idea that you must accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and then that's it, you're going to heaven. But he says that if that's what it takes, accepting Jesus, and that just gets us into heaven, he says that makes accepting Jesus become work righteousness to get into heaven. I'm going to quote him again. If God damns people to hell who don't respond according to a particularly prescribed formula to his grace, then their response is what saves them and not God's grace. Do we really need to obsess with heaven or hell? Is our objective as a Christian just to make sure we get into heaven? Should that be our objective? As Amy Jill Levine says, we don't really need a heaven and hell to motivate us to do the right thing. And she gives as an analogy, in a healthy human family, the children of that family, if you've got good parents, the children of those parents do not honor their father and their mother out of fear that they're going to be beaten if they don't honor them, 
or the adult children don't honor their mother and their father uh, because they're afraid they might lose their inheritance. They honor their parents because their parents loved them and they are responding in love. Likewise, we do the right thing, not out of fear of God or of hell, but out of love for the God who loves us so much, out of love for Jesus who emptied himself for us, who took the form of a human, who was obedient even unto death on the cross, that you and I might truly know the love and the peace of God that passes all understanding. That's what we need to focus on. Do I love God and do I love my neighbor? And when we know how much God loves us, our response is one of love. And we don't need to worry about those other things. My friends, I hope you will have a peaceful week, not at all worried about heaven or hell, but, but instead giving yourself to Christ as surely as he gave himself to you. Amen, and God bless you.